I'm pretty sure Jesus did not lie about this. I want to read a passage. I want to read something that Jesus says. and I'm not sure that everyone kind of gets an understanding, a full understanding of what he's saying. And I think it's important. I think it's beneficial. As a matter of fact, I think it should bring great comfort and joy to know exactly what Jesus is speaking about. You all would admit that we are a long ways removed from not just chronologically in terms of time, 2000 years from what Jesus is saying here as he walked the earth in his incarnate state. We're 2000 years removed from that, but also it's a different land. We are not in first century Judea, nor are we close to, we are certainly far removed from the culture, how they did things. As a matter of fact, our, even in America, our culture has changed in many ways, the way we do things from when I was a little boy, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, or 100 or 200 years ago. So certainly the same things happened then. And so when we read a passage, we might not quite get everything that he's saying. Such a passage is John 14. Look what Jesus said. He says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many dwelling places. Some places may say dwelling man, uh, many mansions. Uh, if it were not so, I would not have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. If, it, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may also be. And you know the way where I am going. Now, let's just pause there for a second. Jesus is making a promise. As a matter of fact, what he's doing, he's comforting. At this time, Jesus is preparing the disciples for his upcoming death. John 14, 15, and 16, he's preparing them. And then he also tells them that in his place coming, he will not leave them by themselves. He'll be with them. The Holy Spirit is going to come. However, they're, they're going to be distraught. Now, he's telling them, look at the words that, that, he's, that he's bringing up. These seem to be words of comfort. He says, do not let or let not your heart be troubled. Believe in me. Uh, believe also in uh, God. Look what he says. If it were not so, I would not have told you. So what is he telling them? And where's the cultural kind of disconnection? Well, in those days, if you were a expectant bride, the expectant groom is going to come for you in a few days. Now, I want to kind of give a picture of how this works in Jewish society. So let's go to Joel 2.16. You don't have to really understand what's happening in Joel 2, but you should understand what's happening in Joel 2 because it's pretty important as far as the nation of Israel, but also the Gentile church coming both to become part of his church. Look what he says in verse 16. He says, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. Let the, let the priest, the Lord's ministers weep between the porch and the altar, let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your inheritance a reproach. Now, stop there. But this whole issue about the bride, the bridegroom and the bride come out of a bridal chamber, in Hebrew culture at that time, what would happen is the father, in some cases, it didn't have to be that the father would give so, sometimes the, the son might choose his own bride. But for us, we're, as far as we're concerned, the father gives us or chooses the bride for the bridegroom. Jesus makes a statement that all the Father has given to me will come. And he makes this point also in John 10. The point is this, a father will have a, a bride, either he selects it or maybe the son does so, but there's a bride that's selected. What happens is in the time of the betrothal period and the actual marriage, the son is away from the bride. She's getting herself ready, but he is doing something. What is he doing? Well, he is either working in his father's house or on his father's land. Either way, it works the same way. And what is he doing? He's preparing a place for the bride. And when the father gives the alert, when the father gives the announcement, the son, the groom, is going to go and get the bride and bring her back. Now, the interesting thing is, though, in, in that culture, if a bride was betrothed to a groom, the only way for it to not happen is for there to be a divorce. It's the same sort of um, issues, same things you have to go through, whether they are, whether the marriage, marriage is consummated or not. 
So he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Let's go back to it. He says, one, don't let your hearts be troubled. He says, in my father's house are many dwelling places. So there are many places I'm preparing a place for you. If it weren't so, if I weren't preparing a place for you, I would not tell you so. Look at how, look at the words, look at the imagery that these words produce. I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And look what he says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back, come to you again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you will be with me also. So he's trying to get them to understand, I'm not leaving you forever. I'm coming back. I would not take the time and the effort to prepare a place for you, my chosen bride. And when the time comes, the father, that's when Jesus makes a statement that uh, I don't know when uh, the time and place has not been given to the son, but to the father, the father knows. Well, he's not necessarily saying that as Jesus, as the son of God, he doesn't actually know the time. But his point is, and the Jews would understand that he's really hearkening back or pointing them towards what happens in this process. The father knows, the father determines when this wedding is going to take place. However, it won't take place before the son is finishing preparing, making preparations. Now, what that looks like in heaven, I have no idea. But we do know this, though. The comfort that Jesus is making is that if it weren't so, I would not have told you so. These are vitally important. Now, we use, see this imagery all throughout the scriptures, um, especially in the Gospels. But we see this imagery about the bride and the groom. John 3.29, he says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So now notice this. This is John the Baptist speaking about the bride and the bridegroom. And so we understand who's the bride, us, the believers, the church, the bridegroom, the groom is Jesus. And then what do we see towards the very end of the Bible? The spirit and the bride say, come. So this imagery is brought out all throughout, especially with the consummation of the Lord and the church. So when Jesus makes his statement, I go to prepare a place for you. This is a promise. And he's saying, I would not tell you so if it were not so. Now, either Jesus is lying or he's not. So if you are his today, you are part of the bride. You are part of his bride, the church. And if he's going to prepare a place for you, he's coming back for you. If you don't think that you are going to be only the only reason he won't come back for you is that you're not his bride. But if you are his bride today, you can rest assured that you will be at him. That's why Jesus makes a statement. And I say the same thing. If it were not so, he would not have told you so. Amen.